from this computer and welcome to the Humankind event, uh, the future of work in this region. My name is Crystal Young and as Executive Director of College Relations, it is my pleasure to host and moderate this event. We have with us today uh, four wonderful individuals joining us to talk about this topic. A little bit about Humankind. Humankind is the college's uh, lecture and cultural series. So we typically pick a theme and explore that theme from many different perspectives throughout the year. And this particular one is like drilling down to what is happening now in our area and what do we think is going to happen in the future in terms of how people, how people work, how people communicate and how people in, you know, engage with their employers. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Alex Andrews. He is the Director of Business Intelligence and Workforce Innovation for Talent First, formerly known as Talent 2025. We also have on the panel Eric Irwin, who's the CEO and President of Floorcraft, Kelly Tomaszewski from uh, Munson Healthcare Manistee, she's the interim president, and Tim Niebuhr from House of Flavors and Company Vice President of Human Resources. Alex is going to kick us off, giving us an overview of trends in our region. So I am going to turn the screen and the mic over to Alex. All righty, thank you, Crystal. Can everybody see my screen? All righty, so first, just a quick little recap of Talent First. Um, so we're sort of a, a think and do tank on education and workforce policy. Um, we have over 120 member CEOs from West Michigan, um, really trying to tackle systems change, systems alignment. Um, so we work really in every system from early childhood through post-secondary through employment um, with, the, with the goal of making West Michigan a top region for talent. Um, so when I was originally approached to kind of speak on this topic, I had several things come to mind. So I had to shoot a few reports over to Crystal um, and we kind of settled on this one. Um, so this is a report that I gave for our CEO council meeting earlier this year, um, really kind of framing up how, how the talent strategy has changed um, really due to COVID. Um, so if you look kind of 10 years ago, this is what the labor market looked like. Um, so most of our workers were, were older, they were Gen X, they were boomers. Uh, millennials were still kind of in this scene, but they weren't as prominent. Uh, if you look at that demographic makeup today, um, you'll see that millennials are now the largest share of our workforce. Um, you also see that Gen Z is kind of cropping up there as well. Um, so this is important because each group has kind of different things that they're expecting from their employer. Um, so obviously these are kind of generalizations, not everybody fits in a box, um, but kind of across the board in West Michigan, we see that younger workers tend to be drawn toward companies that offer some sort of sense of social responsibility, environmental responsibility, um, companies with strong DEI initiatives, um, they really sort of want to know that their job isn't just a job. Um, it's sort of fulfilling that, that higher meaning and impacting the community around them. Millennials are sort of a split between the Gen X and the Gen Z. Um, they're still sort of drawn to some of these idealistic principles, um, but at the end of the day, they have bills to pay. Um, so they do still kind of look for some of those benefits that are more traditional around financial stability. Um, whereas Gen X, a little bit more traditional mindset um, where we're sort of seeing more of a focus on benefits centered around retirement, um, financial stability, um, but really across the board, there's, there's one thing that's common across every age group um, and that is the need for flexibility. Um, so before I get into kind of the five big waves of change that we've identified um, really coming out of the pandemic, uh, I think there's two, two big factors that have really made these prominent. Um, so the first one is really that the pandemic has essentially changed our relationship with work. Um, we've all sort of reevaluated re what's important to us. Um, we sort of realized that we need to have a work-life balance. Um, a job isn't just a job. We want it to mean something to us. Um, that alone necessarily isn't enough to really shape what employers are doing. Uh, but I think the fact that we've seen 
the labor market really tighten up over the past few years is what's driving a lot of this change. Um, so if you look at the ratio of job seekers for job openings in West Michigan, um, we have about six job seekers for every 10 openings. Um, so it's really just a numbers problem. Um, there's simply not enough people in the market to fill every job. So employers have to kind of change what they're doing to try to capture those people who are there. Um, so essentially, the workers, job seekers now have the power in the market, which is not something we saw traditionally. Um, so the first big wave here is really around flexibility. Um, so I think this looks very different depending on your industry. Um, now it's important to consider that West Michigan is predominantly manufacturing, um, about one in five jobs are manufacturing jobs. Um, so we've gotten quite a bit of pushback from manufacturers around the concept of flexibility. Um, and generally, the, the whole basis here is that people want a little bit more control over when and how they work. Um, so it's not just remote work, but also kind of rethinking shifts. Um, so that's sort of the, the challenge we're coming across with manufacturing, um, is that a lot of those jobs you do have to be on site and in person, uh, but we're seeing employers getting a little bit more creative in what those shifts actually look like. Um, so really great example here recently, uh, we were talking to a local manufacturer. Um, the HR leader said that he had a hiring manager who did not wanna hire three brothers um, because they would be like an hour late for their shift. Um, so it was supposed to start at six, uh, but the bus didn't start until seven, so they would be an hour late. Um, but the hiring manager did not want to hire those people because they couldn't work that traditional, you know, six to whatever shift. Um, but the HR leaders had to sort of have that conversation and say, would you rather have nobody working or would you rather have them be an hour late? Um, so we're starting to see more and more examples of employers um, kind of shifting out of that traditional first, second and third shift mentality um, where they're just a little bit more open to being flexible around when people work. Um, a lot of other examples in other industries on how this looks, uh, but generally I think we have sort of three big buckets of employers, um, those who are totally embracing the remote, nobody has to come into the office, but they're still offering at least some sort of touchdown location for people to congregate maybe once a week if they want to have a meeting and they need to collaborate. Um, the other band is sort of those who are forcing everyone to be kind of in the office. Um, I think a lot of that is being driven by this, I guess, threat to culture, because uh, it's really hard to cultivate that sense of community when everybody's online. Um, so we sort of see these two camps emerging, uh, but then there's also those who are living in the middle doing this hybrid model. Um, so essentially, I think the, the sort of average in West Michigan is about three days in the office per week, um, generally sort of geared around the departments and how much they need to collaborate um, or just you know Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, everybody needs to be in, everybody gets Monday and Friday off. Um, so I do kind of predict that remote work is here to stay. Um, it's something people want. It's something we've all had to adapt to and employers have already invested in the technology that it requires to really do things remotely. Um, so there's really no reason to go back. Um, I think there are sort of two threats that come with the flexibility argument. Um, one is really related to equity. Um, so for example, if you're offering remote work to some of the more pro professional level roles, what does that mean for those who kind of have to be there and on the floor? Um, so we're seeing kind of a lot of grumblings about that equity concern coming across, um, just in the sense that it's not necessarily fair for some of these higher skilled positions to be able to work remotely, whereas not everybody has that opportunity. Um, I think the second thing, the second threat really comes in when we're talking about career advancement. Um, so if you look at the data, um, women and people of color are generally more likely to prefer working from home. Um, but at the same time, hiring managers are more likely to promote people who are in the office. Um, so there's some sort of inherent bias in us all um, that sort of thinks that people who are showing up physically present are somehow better at their jobs. Um, so there is sort of a threat of equity and career advancement sort of on the in the future um, if employers aren't being intentional about addressing it early on. Um, next wave really comes in the form of upskilling. Um, so I think especially in today's labor market, we've realized a lot more employers are open to being a little bit more intentional about career pathing, 
career navigation, and really providing those resources that their employees need to advance in their careers. Um, so if you look at the data, employees are way more likely to be engaged if they're seeing that advancement opportunity. Um, so really the, the first decision in a job seeker's mind is, is compensation. Second decision is actually career advancement. Um, so people are willing to leave their employer if they're not offering that sense of advancement. Um, I think this has sort of shifted that traditional mindset again, um, where employers sort of were doing skills training, they were doing tuition reimbursement. Um, but in today's, today's market, today's workforce, that's not enough. Um, so people really need to see what that next step will be, and they need some coaching and they need some guidance to help them get there. Um, and we are seeing employers stepping up to do that, and I think we'll continue to see that in the future. This third area really revolves around social responsibility. Um, so this is especially big with the younger workers, um, but they really want to their, their employer to kind of take a stance on the social, cultural, political factors of the day. Um, I think we've seen kind of a lot of that happening, especially with the, the war in Russia and Ukraine. Um, and a lot of employers have really kind of backed out because they've realized it's not good both for for their consumers to be not taking to not take a stance on that, um, but they're also starting to realize that that is a factor for workers. Um, so I don't necessarily think this is a new concept for employers, um, but I think it is sort of new in the sense that they're thinking about how this impacts their workforce rather than just their customers and consumers. And then this fourth area is really around purpose. Um, so you'll start to see more and more job ads. And there's a really great example here of a, even a McDonald's ad um, kind of appealing to people's innate sense to want to work in a job that offers a sense of purpose. Um, we're also seeing the lines kind of blurring um, where more and more people are actually driving purpose from work than ever before. Um, so employers are kind of stepping up to the challenge um, and really trying to kind of craft how they're attracting and retaining workers by really connecting purpose to profit. Uh, I think it's a lot easier for some organizations and some industries, um, especially healthcare and education. Um, those, those fields are generally rooted in societal good, uh, but for somebody like a manufacturer, it's really hard to kind of connect that maybe frontline worker role with some sort of higher sense of purpose. Um, but all in all, people are really expecting their employers um, to really do something that's impacting the community around them. And then this last one here is really around employer branding. Um, so I think the, the term employer of choice has become really prominent. Um, so even if you kind of look at job ads today, you'll note that they're not really selling you the job anymore. Um, they're really sort of selling you their company, why you should work here, not necessarily what the role entails, but more about the culture, um, and really trying to kind of appeal to everything that people are looking for when it comes to an employer of choice, um, which is really somebody who's listening to their people, they're putting their people first, they're being flexible, they're offering opportunities for advancement, um, really all of the above. Um, so I think companies have sort of been doing this, it just hasn't been as explicit in their marketing. Um, so when we, when we surveyed our CEO council members about what this looks like for them, some of them were, were really robust. They're intentionally telling stories to try to attract people, um, whereas others are actually using this more as a, a marketing thing. Um, so essentially they're bringing their marketing teams in, um, they're really kind of crafting these campaigns around what it looks like to work here and here's why you should work for us. Um, so that's, that's really my spiel. Um, I think sort of when we're thinking about the future of work in conclusion, um, there's a lot of things that I didn't cover related to automation, um, but generally we're sort of seeing employers realizing that they need to do more um, around work-life balance, around mental wellness, um, really around some of those untraditional things that they didn't necessarily think was their role. Um, so essentially the, the lines between work and life have blurred. Um, so we're seeing employers really stepping up to um, to kind of tackle some of those things. Thank you, Alex. Now, a little reminder here, anyone who has a question and answer, or a question, feel free to put it in the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of the screen and we will address it. Alex, a, a quick follow-up. Because 
we are a rural area. Um, how are you seeing, um, remember the, the term bright flight? Like, are you seeing the, the similar trends in terms of movement um, geographically between different companies? Um, is it higher or lower in rural versus metropolitan areas? I definitely think it's it's higher in the metropolitan areas just because there are more options. Um, but I think now in the world of remote work, it's ge geography no longer is really a factor, I guess, depending on your role. Um, so essentially I could be living in Michigan. I could be working for someone in California. Um, so I think we're starting to see a lot more competition from outside Michigan, especially for some of our harder to fill roles. Um, so I think that's kind of working both in our favor and also kind of against our favor. Um, but generally, um, I think it's it's less about where you live now, because um, essentially you could live and work wherever you wanted. Wonderful, thank you very, very much. Um, and I think that line about automation kind of cues up our next presenter very well. I'm gonna turn it over to Eric from Floracraft. Let me see if I can get this to work the right way. I can't seem to find my presentation. You have, if you have a bunch of windows open, don't click on the wrong one. I Maybe know. sharing some, you know, some proprietary info with all of us. What happened to it? I have yours up, Eric. If you want me to share my screen, is and it? Tell me. Can you see it now? Nope. If you click share screen and it pops up. The joys of Zoom presentations. I know I'm a Teams guy. <laughs> okay, so you get, well, open it. If, I don't want to slow people down. And, and uh, if you can open up the copy I sent you, it'd be great, um, Crystal. Uh -huh. and, I, and I do want to thank Crystal. And I want to thank West Shore Community College and all the other panelists. Um, it's a real privilege to be here today and I, and, and to sort of share a little bit about what we're thinking about uh, here at, at Floracraft. For those of you who don't know, Floracraft is a 75-year-old company. Uh, we're a consumer packaged goods company. We're a marketing company, uh, but we're also a marketing company built on top of a manufacturing company. Um, we are vertical in, in the number of foams we, we make. Um, we also design and create and import products from all over the world. Um, we are the world's leading uh, marketer and manufacturer of craft and floral foams. Um, and we really owe it to our, our founder, Lee Shaner, as to why we're here in Ludington. Because when you think about the products that we make, this is not the most convenient place to be with because we are very high cube, low value product that is not in a great supply chain uh, vein where it's it, servicing most of our major national retailers. If you don't know our products, you walk into a Hobby Lobby or a Walmart or a Michaels, that big giant wall of green and white foam, that's all from Floracraft. And then we do a whole bunch of other products around it. I bring this up because when we think about the future of our, our business, we have roughly 250, 300 employees here on the, on the campus in Ludington. And um, the rotation from low skill production manufacturing to thought leadership, product design, and, and automation engineering has really been something that's been going on for the last five years. Um, so thinking about that future and what it's going to be like five years from now is something that the senior team spends an awful lot of time on. Um, we have basically four key strategies, and we're going to talk about really one of them in, in depth today. But our four key strategies really seize the moment for increased productivity, which we will talk about. But we also include becoming the number one brand in both aided and unaided awareness in the floral category, which we have already been able to measure and we are, uh, to reduce our carbon footprint. Thank you, Alex, for, for bringing up the issue around social responsibility. We're a company that's always committed to our community, but we've also been highly innovative in terms of the products and materials that we're working on. We're a plastics company. We know we've got a huge responsibility to make sure that we're reducing our carbon footprint. And we recently introduced a product two years ago where we're the only company that is taking post-consumer plastics and in, in reworking that product into foam. So it is, you know, say it's for a Gen X or a millennial 
um, but it's really for everyone. I mean, this is the responsibility that we've got to act on as a plastics manufacturer. And then, of course, the the, the last key strategy is building a winning culture. And one of the things we we know as we think about how we increased increase our productivity and seizing that moment to to become a, a much more productive company in a in a in an area that you know is so far away from where we really should be manufacturing these products. Um, that is an area will, that will enhance our company's culture because it such, requires such an investment in our employees. So on this first level, um, there's really four key parts that we think about, and it's absolutely true about post-pandemic change. Um, certainly, the investments we've made in automation are really, really critical, and we'll spend a lot, a lot of time on that, but also investments in data analytics. And this is one of the areas that, uh, you know, whether it's measuring and monitoring and improving our production environment or utilizing the syndicated data we get from all of our, our key retailers and analyzing our digital footprints from our consumers against all of our content. All of that has required us to become much, 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 much better at taking the broad buckets of data and putting them into, a, into a easy to digest dashboards. And in fact, we're really proud of the fact that we have built five key apps just for our data in our business to, to make sure that our, our managers and leaders have a chance to access it. Certainly, uh, the pandemic has forced us to learn how to work in new platforms. Um, we are a, a, a Microsoft house. Uh, we have been utilizing Teams at a, at a great, great level. Um, in fact, it's really forced us to rethink about you know, why are we spending so much time on emails and why are we spending so much time on non-productive activities? And so there's a whole level of making sure that we're transforming the methodology of the ways we work together based on the platforms that we're working with. And of course, you know, the interesting on the comment about, about um, remote work and flex work, yes, we, were, we basically only had our production force that was on campus for practically a year and a half um, while everyone else worked from home. But there's no doubt that while we were, we were effective working collaboratively against digital platforms, we found that particularly in terms of innovation around product development, marketing, and sales, that it was really important some of those, those uh, informal communications that happen on a day-by-day -day basis happen. And so we've really been trying to make sure that we bring we redesign our entire collaborative workspace for our, our product development and marketing and sales teams to put everybody into the same room at the same time. But we're highly flexible in terms of enhanced um, collaboration and whether or not people are in the office or not. The big, big upside of that is it's allowed us to, to add talent to our organization from a distributed workforce. We no longer just isolated the higher people that live here in Ludington. We have now been able to open up and we've got employees that are, you know, both senior level executives and, and, and also uh, creatives that are spread across the United States that we work with across these platforms. So labor versus automation. I mean, we were a low skill, uh, low wage production manufacturing house for many years. And uh, the fact is, is our workforce is getting further and further distributed. We have people that drive from Baldwin and, and uh, Manistee. And, you know, it's hard for me to understand that people do that for a 15 or 16 or $17 job. Um, but we've, we've, got, we're, we've got a good culture. We've got good benefits. And the, the community is changing rapidly. And everybody knows this. I mean, this is moving from a, from a you know, blue collar production uh, manufacturing space to a resort town. And uh, it, it, we're seeing it across the board. I'm, I'm sure that Tim as well, um, our starting wages in just the last two and a half years has moved from 10 to $15. Um, uh, we, we, uh, we know that we have to grow our business with less reliance on labor and that will transform our entire workforce. Um, I believe Lettington is a is a prime location, is a great Zoom community. Um, the advantage on that is, is people who want to move here for the lifestyle of being outdoors will bring skills with them that we may not have. And I really hope that that happens because a lot of the kinds of things that we're going to be working on over the next five years are going to require uh, people from West Shore Community College graduates and others that are going to help us uh, basically build the, the infrastructure we need to, to grow our business on a, on a lot less uh, production and manufacturing 
um, employees. You can go to the next slide. So in that area, you know, our automation right now is coming in many forms, and we're you know we're involved in a huge capex um, uh, investment, and we're seeing it because we're a consumer packaged goods company. Automated case erectors and sealers, case printers, side load packers, robotic pallet stackers, wrappers. Um, I think we had an open house here, and we invited the community in. And most of the automation that we have added has been added in the last two and a half years, really pretty much at just before the beginning of the pandemic. Um, I can tell you that it is paying off. We're operating, um, we used to have to flex up with, uh, with temp labor, which is the least productive level of labor that we have. Um, I think uh, two years ago, we would have at this period of time about 105 temp employees. Now we have five. So it is allowing us to really level load our, our, our teams, make sure that we've got a lot more permanent employees and less reliance on that, uh, that, that violent peak that is required with, with temp labors. You know, next slide. <clears throat> if it moves forward, thank you. Because we are a goods, we are a distributor of the goods that we manufacture and a distributor of goods that we, we design and import from other places, moving those goods around our campus is really, really important. We sit on about 16 acres. Um, and so that area of, I'm very excited about AGVs, which you know, are these sort of Roombas for moving pallets ar around. Um, we, sh we load probably close to 2,000 trucks here in um, Ludington annually. And it is one of the things that we've got to get that turnaround time has got to be faster and it's got to require less labor and we've got to be able to do it. And I'm really excited about how the cost of this technology is coming down and, and how we'll be seeing it. Um, whether it's you know loading systems or the conveying systems or, but, or these uh, these moving robots that move goods around, so uh, that's pretty exciting. We're building a, a new thirty five thousand square foot manufacturing space over here, so we'll soon be seeing products that will be going across our entire um, campus and the and the uh, South Campus manufacturing area. Um, you can go to the next slide. You know what this is doing is it's requiring a whole different level of skill sets than what we have, and this is why it's so important that we partner with West Shore and and we we, we participate in terms of, of of finding talent that wants to live here in Ludington because some of this stuff can't be done remotely. I mean, you have to have hands on to work with with some of this, but it is really about how do we enhance and continue to feed this culture of of continuous improvement. We've always sort of had this kaizen attitude here, and it's really important to measure monitor, improve in everything we do. Um, but that really requires a lot of, of base level training. We've, we've established what's called the, the Floracraft Academy here. Um, we've identified, we do nine box um, assessment uh, uh, reviews. And those people that we feel that we should invest in, we are putting them through our own curriculum here at uh, Floracraft. And then we're also supporting them with additional curriculum development that will happen off campus at other, other um, institutions. Um, but as, as anyone who knows working with these kinds of, of, of systems, uh, it's a huge amount of understanding about, about the, uh, the human interface elements around these, this machinery and making sure that we're creating our own programming and being able to, to work with the product. So there's no doubt that you know, the software technology investment and the key personnel investment that we have to make in electrical design and control, mechanical design and automation programming is gonna be critical over the next five years to support these systems that we're, we're uh, transforming to. Go to the next slide, Crystal. Um, Ultimately, we want to become automation independent. Um, we were excited. The last robot we installed, uh, the manufacturer only had to be here for like a day and a half. Uh, the first time he was here for two weeks. Um, our team is building the capabilities to be able to install and program these, these uh, machines. And I got to tell you, that's all internally developed on our part. Um, on top of that, we've built some systems entirely on our own um, that... Uh, we're here at our open house, what we call a big planer rig um, that has got all HMI software in it and servo motors. And we built it with, um, with our own team. So we have a real, real internal um, capabilities that we have to keep on expanding. Um, so across this, you know, we want to be, be vertical in, in, the, in, in our own technology. Certainly, we 
we use you know the, the best of class that's out there, but we want to be able to maintain it and manage it and operate it and alter it in ways that uh, best fit our business. Go to the next slide. One of that is is around programming and uh, this whole issue in terms of of being able to create our own programs to run our own our own um, planning operations, cutting operations, and packaging operations is is critical. Um, right now, our capabilities we have two people that are programming. We're going to have a high need uh, to go way beyond that over the over the next several years. We've got to build those capabilities here. We have to invest in the training and raise those wages for for our electrical. Um, uh, programming and design talent. The next slide. And on top of that, we have to we have to bring in mechanical design capabilities. Many of these these uh, systems, you know, are are mechanical systems, and our team uh, is very very good. But we've got to be able to design these systems as well. Um, we recently entered into a new joint venture with a new company and we're establishing a new business. And we're finding out that there's some great capabilities that are in Eastern Europe, surprisingly, that understand how to build automated mechanical systems. We need to have those capabilities here at Floorcraft, here in Ludington, to help us with these same challenges. Next slide. And of course, you know, this is sort of the last slide and goes exactly sort of to what Alex was saying, is that, um, we have a huge responsibility as a plastic manufacturer to make sure that we're, we are reducing the impact to the environment, and particularly here in Ludington. I mean, Ludington, Western Michigan is known for its beauty and, and we all love it. And that's one of the reasons why we live here. Um, but this responsibility of understanding how we change our materials to make sure that we are um, leaving less harm to the environment is critical. And, and that's gonna require us to have, have much more um, uh, understanding of, of our materials through chemical engineering, um, key blowing agents. Um, and we are, we are committed to uh, taking a tremendous amount of, of greenhouse gases out of, out of the, uh, the production facility that we've got. And while we're way below um, any um, global or, or national standards in terms of greenhouse gases, our goal is to get to net zero. And um, that is critical. Uh, we feel that it's not only is it, we have a responsibility to our consumers, we have a huge responsibility to our community and a huge responsibility to our, to our uh, employees to be doing that. And there's a number of significant initiatives, some of them very small, like you know the LED lighting that we put in place, um, the fact that we became vertical in our in our plastics manufacturing, reduced over 400,000 miles of diesel truck uh, transport. But really, how do we start going to to uh, you know next gen um, blowing agents so that there's basically no harm in what we what we're creating in terms of any of the off gases when we create create fuels? So, in conclusion, I can tell you, you know, we're, we're a business that's been around for 75 years. Um, we're not necessarily in the most economic advantageous place to be, but we are committed to this community. We are committed to remaining independent here in Ludington and the investments that we're gonna make over the next several years and have been making over the next several years will ensure that we're here for another 75 years. Um, we just have to continuously get more, more uh, efficient and more productive in terms of, of how we create our products for our consumers so we can keep, compete globally um, right up here in beautiful Western Michigan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, I have a couple questions for you. Uh, one question that came in is, how does the Zoom community and new residents replace the low-skill workers in our area that either still need jobs or those positions that still need to be filled? Well, um, if, you're a, if you're a digital copywriter doing product detail pages for Amazon and you decide that you're going to work in Ludington and do that, um, that's a skill that we need to have, okay? And I've talked, I think I've talked about at West Shore. I mean, it's, you know, being able to write great digital copy is, is really critical. And I need to provide digital copy for every one of my customers. I have to syndicate and publish the descriptions and benefits of my products across, across the internet for all consumers to be able to find it. And um, that's just one example of, of a role that we've got um, our, digital, our digital access for, for e-commerce, we're running out of out of an employee who lives in Pennsylvania right now. 
Um, I would love it if someone, you know, another company who who is working with remote workers allows someone to work in in um, in Lennington who has some skills that we need to access for for our next generation of growth. And that may also be true in in uh, in product development. It may be true in terms of accounting. It may be true in in a, in a number of areas. Um, there are production engineers we need to have on site because they have to touch the product. Um, but in a number of our other, you know, key thought leadership roles, we need to have the people who know know how to do the the work. And if they happen to live here in Ludington, I'd love that. Are you finding that you are able to, on those entry level positions, train and upscale those individuals to those higher level, either production supervisor or engineering oversight positions? Um, yes and no. Um, you know, certainly this challenge, I think we've got an open position for a chemical engineer right now and we're having difficulties, um, you know, uh, recruiting that locally. Um, but uh, we have raised the capabilities of a lot of line leads that show a tremendous amount of talent and we've invested in them so that they're becoming excellent production supervisors, outstanding production supervisors. Um, we have a we have a good electric electrician program that's in place. We work with you guys on that, um, and we've we've uh, we're developing our really I think a best of class internal electrical group. So um, yeah, we've we've got that. And then in terms of you know the the thought leadership roles, those sales and marketing roles, yeah, we're we're the combination between hiring uh, local and bringing from the outside is allowing us to really invest in 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 and raise up the capabilities of a lot of people. Thank you. I have one more follow up. And that was uh, you made an interesting comment about why are we spending so much time on email? Do you think in the future email is going to become what used to be? So I, I love this topic because my staff hates it when I bring it up. OK, so I can review and see, for example, an employee, how many emails they've read during the course of a month. OK, I can see how many they've taken action on. And it drives me crazy when I see someone who's read 4,500 emails and they've actually taken action on 100, okay? It's like, don't read your email, okay? We don't need email unless you need to document something and it's really important. If you've got a, a you know, a, a, a very important, we need to action, you go through Teams through a, a chat method or you know, you open a window, or you just have a discussion, or you pick up a phone, get, get them on cell phone. But, but we've, we've voiced it over the internet on our computers. I mean, you just you just talk to them. And so yeah, there's a whole bunch of behaviors that I see that are getting in the way of productivity that were brought to us by technology, and we haven't managed that next generation of of where we're moving. So yes, I believe I believe email is is on the way out. Um, it should be on the way out for anybody who really cares about getting stuff done. Um, it's got a place, but it shouldn't be our primary form of communication. Thank you, Alex. I'm curious, do you have any thoughts on that? As well as the, um, Eric just mentioned a tracking of productivity. I know during the COVID shutdown, you know, some of the uh, companies that went fully remote more in uh, metropolitan areas literally had all their employees download trackers, either on their computers or their devices. So it's like, they could track every move or click, I, I'm working now, or click, I'm, yeah. go, you know, grab something to eat. Yeah, I think the data show, the data is a little bit mixed. So essentially, a lot of the, a lot of the data says that people were more productive during lockdown, uh, but their, their work day was significantly expanded. Um, so they weren't really doing the eight to five, nine to five. Um, they were maybe taking taking a long lunch, going for a walk with the dog around the neighborhood, uh, kind of working later into the evening. Um, so essentially the the same amount of work got done. It just wasn't necessarily compressed in the typical work day. Um, now there's other data that shows people were less productive. Um, it seems to be a little bit more mixed. Um, but I think generally people are finding that their employees are happier when they have the option to work remotely. Um, and we're, we're definitely seeing people flocking to those types of positions. Um, as for email, in my world, we are still very much using email. Um, but I think internally, we are seeing a lot more of the, um, the teams, the whatever app you want to use to communicate quickly, 
Um, we're definitely seeing a lot more of that. Um, we're also seeing more intentionality around meetings. Um, so essentially, if we are going to have a team meeting, it's going to mean something. We're going to bring everyone into the office. Um, it's not just the, the standard kind of scrum meetings we saw before um, where people were kind of wasting their time just, just talking. Um, I think there's a lot more intentionality now around people's time. Um, so I think that's definitely something that will we'll move forward. Thank you so much to you both. I definitely appreciate uh, Eric, that presentation and then the dialogue. Next up, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Tim from House of Flavors. All right, well, thank you, Crystal. Um, great to be here. Uh, very interesting, Eric and Alex, appreciate you guys. Um, Kelly, looking forward to what you have to say as well. Um, if I look for... You got your share button, share screen. There we go, we can see it. So I'm gonna go to normal from the beginning here. There we go. Um, to answer the question, what's being done to drive change and how we're preparing for the future, um, I, I'm gonna talk primarily about people and culture. Um, I'm calling this accelerating the journey. Uh, first, I'd like to clarify a little bit about who we are as a company. Um, and then share some assumptions about what we're thinking about in terms of strategy and impact. Uh, and then address some challenges and then finish by introducing you to what, what we're calling our care circle. And I think this will parallel a lot of what uh, Eric had said and what uh, Andrew had said as well. <clears throat> I joined the company in 2017, uh, moved up here to the Ludington area. So as I talk to people in the community, I'm a newbie. Right. I mean, there's a lot of people in this town that have been here forever. And uh, my wife and I moved up from the Grand Rapids area and we really love it. So, um, but the biggest thing that the owner of the company talked about when I joined the company is uh, as we prepare for the future um, and, and we embark on a significant culture change journey, the biggest thing that we're, we're really interested in is, is how do we drive our culture change? How do we drive a better brand image in the marketplace as an employer? Okay. And then how do we become a better uh, community partner as well? So um, it, the focus of driving that culture change is primarily centered around systems, processes, and getting the right people in place. So um, to jump to the next piece, just a little bit about who we are. Um, those of you that uh, do know us uh, know that we are a contract manufacturer of retail and bulk ice cream products. Uh, it's about $150 million a year business. Uh, we, we produce about 26 million gallons a year uh, of a packaged ice cream. Anything from a pint to a three gallon can, the three gallon cans end up in the restaurant business. Uh, or scoop shops or, or those kinds of things. We trace our roots back to 1929. I, if you think about history here in Ludington back in that day, it was Miller Dairy, okay, delivering milk door to door, okay. Over time, um, they started generating an ice cream product, primarily sold through a soda fountain uh, storefront type of location. Uh, and then uh, the Neal family kind of came on board, uh, purchased uh, part of the uh, Miller Dairy, renamed it Park Dairy, and Park Dairy served, uh, you know, served as Park Dairy for quite some time, and then eventually was rebranded to become House of Flavors. And at that time, with the Neal family, uh, they were opening up restaurants around the area. Um, you know, the other thing that they had introduced was uh, a retail branded House of Flavors product. So you could go into Meyer, you could go into the grocery stores and find a House of Flavors brand of ice cream. Well, of course, nowadays you can't do that because we're all contract manufacturing. Uh, about 1999, a little after uh, a group came in town, bought House of Flavors manufacturing from Bob Neal. And uh, that company was called Protein Holdings. Protein um, was a group of families from the Portland, Maine area, Connecticut, you know, up in that area uh, that started a ministry. And what they were doing were buying companies, primarily dairy related companies for the purpose of putting those profits into their foundation. So um, 
there's a, a foundation called Pro, the Protein Foundation. And um, right now, House of Flavors is the only company that Protein Holding owns. So the purpose of our business, why we exist, is to be a funding engine for the foundation. That's it. And so, uh, you know, Eric, you talked about people looking for something that's value, you know, feels valuable, and that sort of thing. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Since 1999, uh, the company grew from like 60 employees to about 240 employees currently, um, mostly direct labor workforce. Uh, we operate across three shifts, but you know, Eric talked a lot about the need for you know professional folks, highly uh, specialized engineering folks. Um, most of our workforce here, and, and I think it'll continue in the future, is going to be uh, direct labor. Um, it's a semi-skilled workforce. Uh, what we mean by that is, you know, we, we have complex processes uh, operating complex equipment. And so, you know, for us, uh, the important skills uh, in an employee, even though they're a per we call them a production employee, um, literacy, literacy is important uh, because they're, they're dealing with a lot of written work instructions, written recipes, those kinds of things. Agility, the ability to, to you know, learn one machine and then learn a different line, help out over here, uh, those kinds of things. So agility is, is critically important. Communication skills are critical. All through the supply chain process, uh, you know, here within the facility, there's constant communication. And a lot of that is primarily because we're a process manufacturer, which I'll talk about in a minute. And the other big piece is collaboration. Uh, because we're a process manufacturing organization in the process and flow flows through various departments, these departments are continually talking to each other. So process manufacturing basically means that, um, you know, the employee isn't managing what's in front of them necessarily, like traditional manufacturing. Traditional manufacturing, the employee pushes a button, the machine cycles, take the part out and off it goes. For us, once the uh, milk product and the you know liquid sugar products go in the silo, starts to go through the system, we don't want to stop it. Okay, so a lot of the challenges that I'm going to talk about uh, kind of relate to the fact that we're a process manufacturing organization. And the other uh, you know, thing about us that that impacts how we think about the future is we're at max capacity. Um, we're at uh, 26 million gallons and we can't really grow any more than that. And a lot of it's based on our footprint, which I can talk about here uh, in a minute. So that's a little bit about us. Let's jump to some assumptions that I think about or we think about when we do strategic planning, um, particularly as it relates to people in the workforce. One uh, assumption we're working with is the birth rate and the demographics that are happening. Um, what we're seeing is, uh, you know, demographically around the country, birth, uh, birth rates aren't increasing, right? Uh, and in some areas, they're decreasing. What does that mean? Well, from a labor pool standpoint, it means that now, five years, 10 years down the road, there's less people um, uh, coming into the labor, uh, coming, you know, becoming available for us to be able to hire. The other part of that, according to BLS statistics, um, the labor force participation rates are challenged. So as we make assumptions about our future, we're thinking we need to be less and less dependent on the worker, okay? Now, um, automation is a big part of what we wanna do in the future. And, you know, Floorcraft certainly got some cool stuff there, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the challenges related to that for us as well. Other assumptions we think about is um, immigration policy, you know? Um, uh, new thinking related to legal immigration could really help us as an employer. Uh, we're not counting on it, right? Because it's such a political hot potato and, um, you know, I don't really anticipate, uh, we're not counting on that uh, getting done, but that would really help. Um, Alex talked a lot about people's changing preferences. Well, our assumption was the same, you know, the, uh, you know, there's a change in how people feel about their purpose, you know, why are they working, right? Different generations have different viewpoints on that. Um, also what they desire in a job and a career. Um, the way we're structured in terms of job design uh, 
is very traditional. Okay. So that's assumptions. As we look at you know some of the challenges, um, we think about the future of, of of work as a process manufacturer. We're thinking about workflow um, and, and the, the types of work schedules and the work flexibility that these folks entering the workforce and predominant in the workforce are looking for. We can't really do much for them, right? We're a traditional three shift operation. The shifts are what they are. Um, I've had very little success introducing the concept of part time labor, of flexible labor. Uh, into the manufacturing operation at this point. And, and we're particularly thinking about it because, because of the process, okay? So our challenge in the future is really to think about our process and say, okay, how, how can we become more adaptive? How can we become more flexible, right? So we can take advantage of that, that sort of need that the population has. Um, we're space constraints, constrained, okay? Um, we have a manufacturing plant downtown Lettington here. Uh, we have a very small footprint. Um, you know, Eric talked a little bit about, you know, we're a, we're a, a tourist town now, right? So uh, the folks that uh, are in the mayor's office and the, those places, you know, they don't really want big manufacturing space right along Lettington Avenue, right? So um, we're a little bit challenged in terms of our footprint. We've got four production lines that run out of the building, um, you know, 100, 150 people, you know, right in that space. Uh, so for us to kind of think about uh, pick and pack uh, automation, we don't have anywhere to put it, okay? We'd love to be able to engineer it into the space, but the space isn't big enough. Um, the other thing we think about in terms of challenge is uh, we desire to invest in things uh, systems and process that'll improve throughput, right? The speed of how products flow through the system. Uh, unfortunately, right now, the more current need is infrastructure related, okay? We can't necessarily improve the speed if we can't get our ammonia refrigeration systems powerful enough to, to, uh, uh, to allow us to, to go that fast. So, in the short term, the big investment is in infrastructure. Longer term, we're gonna join uh, Eric on his journey uh, to be a little bit more oriented around some automation where we can fit it in, okay? So, let's talk about the journey. Well, um, we're focused, how are we focused on, the, on work? Well, we're intent, intensely and intentionally focused on the employee experience, okay? What is the employee experience on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour, shift-to-shift, week-to-week? What do they experience? So uh, we measure that in what's called employee engagement or morale, right? Uh, we use a corporate leadership council model. And, and what that says is um, employee engagement is what the employee thinks in their head logically and feels in their heart emotionally that's in their best interest to stay with a company and perform, okay? In years past, uh, in the human resource profession, the management profession, we're primarily oriented around the logical, tangible things that are important to the employee. Now we have to be also even more and more intentional about how they feel, okay? What's going on in their heart. Uh, so the cultural journey that we're on are building systems and process that drive higher employee engagement. Some examples of that, uh, would be the quality of the employment process. Is it a very simple process to walk down? Uh, the quality of orientation and onboarding, okay? Uh, we launched a new system uh, for onboarding we call the Launch Academy. Three days of, you know, in a classroom, uh, going on tours, uh, those kinds of things, and then a 90-day process where there's various scheduled touch points where different layers of management have touch points with that new employee to really talk to them about what barriers are you facing? How can we put our arms around you and, and reduce those barriers? So the quality of orientation and onboarding has really helped quality of communication systems. Um, you know, employees want to know what's going on, right? And so um, we actually had some training with a local organization called the SFM group 
here in town and, and they taught us how to do shift huddles. Okay, and that shift huddle is a really critical, important piece and really improves the employee experience. Um, quality facilities, tools, equipment, uh, quality management. Uh, that's another a big part of our journey. Um, we introduced uh, what, what we call the recipe and it's a, uh, a very deliberate and intentional management training process. Uh, and so all of those things I think have become you know, a pretty significant part of our journey. What else? Well, uh, we call this our care circle. And we feel that to accelerate our journey, we need to put our arms around our employee with services and support. Now, 35 years ago, 40 years ago, when I was first getting in, into business and in manufacturing, we didn't necessarily care about that, right? The employee's responsibility was to punch in when they were told, do what we told them, punch in. And, you know, we, we told the employee at that point, hey, you got to leave your personal problems at the door, right? Well, not anymore. Um, I use an analogy, it's, it's, a, it's called the backpack analogy. So figuratively, every employee comes to work with a backpack on, right? Um, that backpack uh, impacts how they do their job, okay? So if their backpack is light, maybe they don't carry with them a whole lot of personal issues and stresses, okay? Maybe there's not a whole lot in their backpack. A lot of our employees, you know, come to work with a bowling ball in their backpack figuratively, right? That bowling ball represents, you know, a marriage that's falling apart, um, addiction issue, you know, a child issue, you know, all of those kinds of things. And so with this care circle, what we've really tried to think through is how do we help the employee lighten that backpack so that their experience on the job is, you know, going to be better. Now, what we gain in the process as an employer is how your employee engagement, right? So, um, so let's talk about these things quickly. Uh, the first one is purpose. You can see it uh, as part of the care circle there. Um, what we try and uh, drive the point home to our employees is that what you do matters to people, okay? Every minute of every day, what you do matters and, and, and in two ways, right? One way is that that ice cream product brings joy to people, okay? So we really highlight the fact that you as an employee doing your job, it's not just a job. You're creating fun and joy for somebody else, right? It's the family that's having a birthday party. It's, you know, the family that's bringing their family to a spook shop, those kinds of things. The other part of the purpose statement is, in terms of what you do matters, is um, our profits are driven to the foundation, okay? So our employees can drive down Ludington Avenue and they can you know, count the number of places where the Protein Foundation has donated money. The Cove, Jericho House, Habitat, you know, all of these places. Um, you know, and again, we're really trying to get that employee to, to wrap their brain around the fact that what you do matters to people. And I think that that really helps culture. And it kind of parallels what Alex was telling us, right? About, employees looking for opportunities to, to do something that has purpose. The next one is vision and values. Um, we wanna be a values driven organization. So one of the things that really accelerated our, our culture change journey and kind of positions us for the future is uh, making decisions based on values. Um, the owner sat down, they developed a set of values a while back um, and we use those values all the time. Um, and our employees can gain a sense of peace from that, right? One of our values is do the right thing, okay? Do the right thing comes up all the time as it relates to safety, uh, policy and practice, all of these things. So um, being a values-driven organization where those values guide our decision-making is really important, brings peace to the employee. From a culture standpoint, I, you know, I can talk for days on culture, um, but build, building a positive high performance culture is pretty important and it's part of our journey. We've made a lot of organizational structure changes, putting the right people in, in the right seats, uh, bringing a higher level of professional management in the organization. Uh, the recipe management skills training program I mentioned is critically important to helping us build our culture. Um, the other piece is documented systems and processes and layered process audits. We're really kind of tipping, dipping our toe in kind of the continuous improvement arena. 
uh, and it's really driving some positive culture change because now the employee is involved, right? One of the most important components to lean manufacturing is employee empowerment and employee participation. So uh, that's really driving uh, positive culture change. Health and safety, the next box uh, on our, our care circle, nothing demonstrates care more to the employee than a manager that's focused on their safety, okay? And so we've invested in a, in a very capable safety manager recently. Uh, we've got teams that are driving a much higher level of focus and intentionality around things that you think might be simple, right? PPE, um, you know, following uh, lockout tagout protocols, all those kinds of things, uh, just really taking it to a higher level. And it's really impacting our culture because the employees are saying, hey, they do care about me because these things are important. Comp and benefits, um, you know, I think about comp and benefits still in terms of Maslow's hierarchy. I know that goes back a long ways, but, you know, you have to be competitive from a compensation standpoint, or you can't even get into the dance, right? So um, our desire is to be competitive in the local market. Um, one of the things I, I talk to our, our leadership about is we don't necessarily compete with the other businesses in the area for talent. Okay, we compete with ourselves, okay? If we can do our best as an employer, if we can do the right thing, if we can wrap this care circle around people, we don't have to worry necessarily about what the other companies are doing, but we do have to be competitive from a pay standpoint, okay? From a benefit standpoint, I know a lot of the uh, local employers are dealing with this a lot. Um, medical benefits and those kinds of things are all important and fairly traditional, but we really have to wrap more mental health benefits around our employees. Um, that's a problem in our community. Um, we've talked about that with, uh, you know, a number of the different organizations here in town, access to mental health, um, mental health providers that actually take insurance, okay? You know, those kinds of things. The next part of the care circle is careers. Uh, we're very intentional about talent review, including the nine box process like Eric mentioned. Uh, we're also very intentional about career development and creating career ladders. Now career ladders within some departments operate you know, a little smoother than others, but we have a very talented young man uh, who drives our uh, training and development process. And uh, uh, so, you know, a lot of the individuals who are looking for help um, or, are, or are being driven, you know, or brought to him for help, um, you know, we can wrap our arms around those folks too and help them build a career. The goal is really to, to allow a person to be successful, however they define it, right? Not everybody wants to be a manager. Not everybody wants, you know, uh, if we've got a palletizer that wants to be a CDL truck driver, we'll send them to school, right? So, those are the kinds of things that, that are important in that careers box. Now, the last two are investments that we've made. One, uh, we've made an investment uh, with Corporate Chaplains of America to have a corporate chaplain on site. Um, it's been unbelievable, right? Back to the backpack analogy, uh, this individual is on site, um, you know, a couple of times a week, he'll, he'll go and touch every employee all, all across the ship. And that touch point's really important. Um, the, the purpose of the chaplain is not to convert somebody to Christianity, okay? The purpose of the chaplain is to really help people lighten their backpack if they can, okay? The last one I can talk about uh, is uh, a resource coach, uh, like Floorcraft and a lot of the other manufacturers here. Uh, we participate with the Lakeshore uh, Employer Resource Network, having that coach on site. And again, this is backpack reduction stuff but it's more practical types of things, you know, childcare, housing, um, you know, a loan to get the car repaired, those kinds of things. So, um, you know, from a summary standpoint, you know, I think like Flora Craft, like Eric mentioned, we, we wanna be an employer of choice in the area, right? Um, we're on this journey. You know, we talk a lot about being world-class, but we don't need to be world-class. We just need to be best in class and we need to aspire to be the best that we can be, right? Um, and we do aspire to be an employer of choice in the area. Let's face it, I mean, everybody, you know, most of us do, right? We wanna have a positive reputation. Uh, we wanna have a positive brand image. 
uh, as an employer, and we want to have a uh, do a lot uh, for the community. Okay, that's all I have, Crystal. Well, thank you, Tim. Um, uh, follow up question. Okay. You know, you talked a lot about that wraparound care piece, and um, there's a lot of warm and fuzzy in there for what might be perceived to, you know blue collar kind of roughneck manufacturing sector. So how has the, can you just in a, you know, kind of sum up, how has it been received? Um, you know, sometimes people think I'm crazy. Um, I, I would say for the most part, um, there's a need and people want to be, they want to feel they're cared for. Um, I think it's a basic human need. Um, so yeah, I, I think I, I, there's never any pushback necessarily. Sometimes people roll their eyes at me when I use like the backpack analogy and some of those kinds of things. But on the other hand, we're there. You know, uh, if they have a crisis, if they have a problem, you know, there's somebody there. So I think that is wonderful, and I do think um, just some interactions I've had with that Gen Z generation. Uh, I think that in the future, we are definitely going to see more of that, not necessarily even needed, but expected. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Yeah. I'm yeah. going to turn it over to Kelly. Um, I'm curious, I'm excited to hear what she has to say from the healthcare perspective of things. Kelly, you have the floor. And you are muted if you're talking. You're like, oh, where's the where's the unmute? Lower left. There. there. You and can you see my screen? Okay. Yes, we can. Wonderful. I was. I'm a, a Teams girl as well. So the, you know, Zoom. I need to learn a little bit. So. Um, well, thank you so much, Crystal and West Shore Community College for inviting me to be on this panel today. So enjoyed Eric, Alex and Tim, what you have to say about industry other than healthcare. So I think it's super informative, but I'm here today just to talk about the future of healthcare kind of quick where we've been and what we've been through. I think we've all been through the pandemic and what that cha those changes have really meant to healthcare. Um, I've been in healthcare a long time, over 35 years. and healthcare has always been about change. Healthcare is, you know, we don't do things the same year to year. We have a lot of research and, and really apply that to so we can give the best care to our patients. And really, we talk about best practice all the time. But that best practice can change over time. As we learn more and, and do our research, we know that we can continue to improve that patient experience. And the pandemic changed that for us. I None of the people that I work with have lived through a pandemic. Um, it's been a long time since we've had one. But it's really changed not only how we care for our patients, but how we care for our staff that take care of the patients. Um, people I have been, were afraid. They were afraid to come in, into the hospital setting. They were afraid in general to go out into the community. And it really did put people, you know, closer to home or actually in their homes. And, you know, there was some good to that and there were some challenges with healthcare. So we really had to think quickly on our feet in a way that we haven't before. Um, as I mentioned, change has always happened, but this, the speed of the change that we had to implement, sometimes the rules change daily for us. It didn't happen every day that way, but there were times that PPE requirements and how many people you could have in a room and all the things that we had to deal with um, would change on a, a, a daily basis. And that was very confusing, I think, for our communities, for our staff, and for our patients. And so we had to think of ways that we could lessen that confusion and continue to offer uh, wonderful health care here in our community and to those um, that we take care of. So we had to really think about um, not only how we were delivering health care, but also how we could do it differently. Because we wanted to continue to be the first choice for our patients in the community, but we also wanted to continue to be the place where our health care team wanted to work. And so um, the traditional model of healthcare was you, you called the office, you made an appointment with your doctor, um, they put you on the schedule and you would physically show up to your appointment. Um, if you needed to um, go to the hospital for an emergency visit or another test, you would show up and that's how that would work. Well, we knew that that had to change because not everybody was not only doing that, but we also knew that we need to think differently about how folks 
and conveniently could get that appointment that they needed. Because we did see a decline in um, patients that were actually getting the care, the preventative care that they needed. So when we finally did see patients, they were sicker than what we had seen before. And that's, you know, very concerning when you're really, it's important for you to take care of your community and population health. So we had to be flexible and think about that. And kind of to Alex's point, you know, with the different age groups and, and people that we take care of, you know, some of our older population, that was a very foreign concept of trying to figure out how to do things remotely. Um, and some, some folks, they didn't just because it was too confusing and too hard for them. So we had to figure out in a very short amount of time how to make sure that we could do that for our patients. So uh, these are some of the things that we have implemented um, within the Munson healthcare system um, and largely driven by the pandemic. And one of the first things that we did is we needed to be important for people to find a doctor in, in their directory. We found that, you know, we're a tourist town here in Manistee and the surrounding areas, and a lot of folks would be here in the summer and they would go home um, in the off season. Well, we found that the off season changed. The off season, there was a lot of spread into the fall. Some people didn't go home at all, and that meant they didn't have a local doctor. Hey, or, Carly, I hate to interrupt you. Your slides aren't um, advancing, so I think we were just, you shared a different screen. Uh -oh. we see your presentation. Uh oh, okay. I've hit the arrow, so I'm. We're still on future of healthcare. So you might just want to stop sharing and then. Reshare, no worries. Or maybe, can you pull it up? Is there a way you I can pull it up? I certainly can. You just got to stop. If you can stop sharing, I'll pull yours up and share. Can you stop? I can't find where it says stop. I'm so sorry. No, you're good. This is so good because you look at the difference between <laughs> Zoom and Teams. And we've had this conversation with uh, I can't you know, remote and work. Show. How about now? It's showing now. You're good. Virtual urgent care. Okay. And if I need help trying to figure out how to keep going, I'll I'll ask okay. for I'll phone a friend, okay. which will be you. All right, virtual urgent care. So we knew that we had to figure out ways that um, we could get people cooked up. And now you're seeing finding doctor directory. That's where I want to be. Thank you. Um, so we knew that we wanted to get folks that were not local hooked up with a, a provider because we knew that they did not, you weren't want, going to want to come in if you needed a new prescription or something to the ER. So we knew that we had to look at the population that we didn't currently that we wouldn't have in the off season and give them an opportunity without having to come to the hospital and figure that out. So we were able to send out information how, how people could go online and find a, a provider that they would be interested in seeing and then they could schedule an appointment. That was a big deal for us because we hadn't done anything like that before and we did see absolutely an uptick of new patients um, for all the right reasons because we knew that they needed to get the care that they needed um, and because like I said some people just didn't go home which was important and of course we helped facilitate with a provider that they saw if they were in Chicago or Detroit or Grand Rapids. We helped coordinate that care so they can make sure that they were getting that preventative care that they needed. Are you seeing the next slide that says health questions? There we go. Um, health questions. This is a this is something that was very largely driven by the pandemic. Um, there were a lot of questions. As I said, there was confusion. Things changed daily. People needed to know what they could do, what was going to be the best way that they could take care of themselves and keep themselves healthy. And so we we implemented an ask a nurse um, call that people could call up and get a nurse. Um, 20, it wasn't 24 hours a day. It started out to be about 16 hours a day. So if you had a question about your health, you weren't sure about something, you didn't know if you should get the immunization or not, you didn't know if you should get a booster eventually, whatever healthcare question that you had, we wanted people to be able to call and get that information and not delay getting the answers that they needed. Um, there are a lot of systems within Michigan that already had Ask a Nurse. We just had never had the need for it. So it was something that we wanted to make sure that we could provide to our communities. And it was a huge success. We were getting thousands of calls a day. Day. thousands. We had to really expand um, the staffing that we had for that. It, it really escalated much quicker than we would have anticipated, but made us feel really good that we were giving people the information that they needed to take good care of themselves. And if we needed to make a referral, then we could help facilitate, facilitate that for them. Um, another thing that we implemented are virtual visits. So because people were concerned about actually coming into an environment um, 
early on in the pandemic, people were worried to go to the store. They were worried to go to their doctor's office. So we implemented virtual visits, which meant you could actually schedule that with an office here. Um, you wouldn't have to wait in a queue. You could schedule an appointment at three o'clock in the afternoon if that was going to be a time that worked for you. Um, and that you were able to see an, either a physician or you could see a nurse practitioner or a PA that was going to be able to answer your questions and give you the information that you needed. And then if you needed a prescription or if you needed a follow up visit, um, that care was happening and people were able to do that right from their phone. I know um, I personally used it because I had a situation with my eye and the doctor said, put your eye up to the screen. So I was able to do that, diagnosed what my issue was, and it was super convenient. So again, things we wouldn't have implemented before the pandemic, but you know, good things came from the pandemic. And some of these situations are things that were absolutely wonderful for our patients to have access to the healthcare that they needed. Um, I just wanted to share with you what we are able to provide for virtual visits, um, primary care visits. So if you need to see your PCP or the person you see for your annual visits, you can absolutely do that visit virtually. Pediatrics, we do have pediatrics here on site, but it's something that if you have a sick child at home, you don't want to bring them in, you don't have to. Um, behavior health, I've heard that a couple of times already on this call today um, about the importance of behavior health. Behavior health, unfortunately, we saw a, a big spike in the, the folks that needed that care. Pandemic, you know, for some was uh, wonderful to stay home and be able to work from home. And for some, it was extremely extremely isolating and not great for their overall health. And so we were able to connect with that um, resource here in, in the, this area, which was um, very helpful. And one of the points I want to make is, you know, you don't have to have that specialist right here in a rural health community to have access to that care. And that's one thing that these virtual visits have done. And behavioral health is one of those things with psychiatric care. Um, it is something that you can and it's the privacy of your own home where you can feel it's super confidential um, and you can actually, you don't have to wait until somebody's here on site or have to travel to get that care. Um, outpatient substance abuse disorder, unfortunately, we saw a big spike in that. Again, that isolation piece and just, you know, very different lifestyle for many people um, that didn't really benefit from that experience. And so we wanted to make sure that we could you know, provide that support that folks are gonna need to, to keep them as healthy as possible. Um, OBGYN can't deliver a baby over virtual visit. We didn't wanna do that, but you can certainly do preventative care if you have concerns or issues. And then if you needed to be seen, you could make sure that you got that appointment through virtual care. Um, physical therapy, PT and OT and speech, you're able to provide that. So that kept people healthy and really involved in their, their care, which was wonderful. Um, med surge, chronic disease management, urgent care. We know that if you had a sore throat, an eye issue like I did, or um, ear infection, they would be able to screen you over, um, over the, the screen. And if you needed to come in, then they would advise you to do that. And then healthcare education. That's a big piece about being preventative. I think about diabetes, um, child per birth preparation. There's so many things that we do when you come in to be seen by your primary care provider that keeps you healthy. And those are these are so many areas that we could do that. You could be proactive in your health and making sure that you're getting the care that you need in a timely fashion. And then this just gives information about if you couldn't wait for a visit, this is how you were able to get it um, taken care of. And it was a one, two, three. We did have to walk some people through this, just like I had to have help with my slideshow just now. But guess what? It all works out. And we wanted, and we had great success with that. And this virtual care, this didn't go away just because things have kind of lessened now. I mean, we still have issues with COVID. We talk about it every day. Um, you know, we're going to, it's a new world that we live in now. We have to figure out ways that we can provide care in this environment. Um, so it's still a convenient way. And we do have to think about, um, you know, there's a population, the youngers that are coming up that they're so used to doing so much on their phone. We want to make sure that they have access to everything that they need and really bringing everybody else on board. So again, it doesn't, we're not going to, we will likely never go back to that old model of providing healthcare to our communities. And this has been a wonderful opportunity for us to just kind of get plugged into what we needed to do. And I, as I mentioned, urgent care, that is something that, that's our walk-in clinic here. We don't have an urgent care right here in Manistee, but um, there's a long list of things that you can be seen for. Um, you know, if you have um, 
a rash, you can show the rash to the provider and they can give you an idea of what they think it is and they'll provide medication if they need it. Just these are the things that you would normally come in for. And these are also things that if you don't get treated early on can lead to further complications and further illness. And so it's really doing that, getting ahead of it. And so we make sure people don't wait and they make it really uh, convenient for them. So lots of work trying to get our patients the care that they need in a different model. But we also wanted to focus on what's important for our employees. And I, you know, you got, we've all talked about, you know, caring for our employees. And that's always, it's such a valuable source um, for us. It's what we do every day. It's why we show up. We want to take care of our employees. As I mentioned, I've been a nurse for in healthcare for 35 years, and I used to take care of patients. Now my job is to take care of the people that take care of the patients. And so that's really important. It's a retention and recruitment issue. Um, in our industry in healthcare, um, there have been reports up to 20% of healthcare um, providers left the um, healthcare arena because it was hard. PPE was very difficult, fear. The work has always been hard in healthcare, but if you saw pictures and they were on front of Time Magazine where you had the masks where people were had bruising from all the PPE that they had to wear when they were taking care of patients, that was real. I mean, that happened even here in Manistee. So um, with all of the change, all the challenges, um, folks made decisions that said, I'm close to retirement. I'm going to be done early. I don't want to stay in this environment. Maybe I'll travel and not be in my local market because you're going to get a bigger price tag for that. Or just rethought their lives and thought, I really don't want to be in this environment anymore. So, you know, it was important for us to figure out um, what we could do to retain talent. Um, obviously, in healthcare, a lot of the care that we give does need to be at the elbow or right next to the patient. But there are many, many departments within the healthcare team that don't have to be on site. Um, and so those were opportunities for us for that work-life balance, for the worker satisfaction, and really deciding what has to be on site and what doesn't. So that, uh, the last part of my um, talk, I'm going to go ahead and share that with you. So this lady's happy because she gets to work from home um, and a lot of people are really excited and I will tell you, uh, I think a lot of industries are this way, but we once we made the transition kind of department by department who could work from home and really decide if we were getting that same, you know, connection, getting that same, you know, workload um, completed in a timely fashion. Um, there are many of these departments that are not back on site now and probably likely will stay remote just because we found it, it works great. They love it. Um, we're happy because they're happy and we also get the work done in a timely fashion. So again, one of the things we probably wouldn't have thought of if we didn't have um, the pandemic. All of our billing and coding, accounting, revenue cycle work um, does not need to be on site for that. There are way, we have teams meetings with them, with them if we have questions or issues, but that is absolutely something that can be done from home. And you know what? It, billing and coding, if you want to start at four o'clock in the morning and work until whatever, you can do that. It's not an eight to five, again, like we heard on this call. So it's really, you know, gives folks the, the flexibility and the freedom that they want with the, you know, with this expectation set as to what the timeline is able to do it. Information systems, they can remote into your computer. When you call and you say, I have a problem, they can remote in. They can also do a lot of the connectivity and, and interfaces and things that they need to do without being on site. Um, case management, that is something that we um, use when we're looking at an admission, if it meets criteria or not. It's just one of those healthcare things, does not need to be on site. All of our education, there is some education that we do need to do um, in person. We can even remote into a patient's room if somebody's um, working from home. We do have educators that are still on site because some of that just needs to be on site, especially if it's diabetes, certain pieces of it where you need to show someone how to draw their blood sugar, that kind of thing. And it's helpful to be right there. But we can do a blend too. It's not an all or nothing. And then telemedicine um, is something that we've actually done here in Manistee for about seven years. It's the doctor on the TV as it was first referred to when we started. And we started not only with our hospitalist groups, so that's the doctors that take care of you when you're in the hospital. And we also started with our cancer and infusion center seven years ago. And and, you know, it was a very new concept here. And it was really in the industry, very new. You know, there was a lot of concern. Are we going to get the same experience, the same outcomes, the same timely um, inter interaction with the patients? And it has turned out to be wonderful. So we had a lot of experience with telemedicine here in Manistee before we went to a more broad um, with the psych and, and peds and other things that we've already talked about. So it's definitely something we can do to the point where we have carts 
where we, you bring the cart in, the nurse and the doctor and the family are all in the, you know, they feel like they're in the room together, but the doctor's on the screen. Um, we can even listen to heart and lung sounds because we have a special equipment that's attached to that. So it really does feel like the doctor's in the room because they really are. They just aren't sitting at the bedside with you, but they're on the screen and it feels like they're in the room with you. Um, that is something that's been a little bit of a culture shift here. And, you know, we've been able to do it successfully for a really long time. Um, the last thing is for those folks that work at home, you know, you want to be able to have all the resources at your fingertips. So your job uh, continues to be not only rewarding, but you have everything that you need. So everything that we have is on the internet here within the Munson system, policies, all the communication. Yes, the emails have all the information. So I love that idea about less emails. If I could change one thing about my job, it'd probably be that. 24-7 um, help desk support if you need it. And then all the apps that we need for if there's a disaster or there's a problem. Problem. Um, we get notification on Spoke Mobile, but you can even punch in and out um, remotely. So there's just so many ways now that we have learned you don't have to be in the same room or in the same um, facility to make sure that you get everything done that you need to take care of, of the elements of your, your job. And, uh, you know, changes aren't over in healthcare. We'll continue to be challenged and have challenges, um, but we've learned that we can pivot pretty quickly and, and do the right work so we can make sure that we're putting our staff and our patients in the center of everything that we do. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly. I have um, one broad question kind of for all of you as we are looking to wrap up here, being mindful of time. So John Maynard Keynes was a... British economist back in the turn of the century, 1920s, 1930s. And he was one that famously predicted that his grandchildren would only work 15 hours a week because of automation and different things in place. So in terms of the 40 hour work week and how we see other, you know, countries testing out, you know, what works, what does and employ productivity. If I could just have thoughts from each of you on that, just a couple sentences, Eric, if you'd go first. Well, we would like to get 80 hours work out of 40 hours. So, you know, I, I just, I, I, I'll tell you, we do have a number of, you know, four tens that we do, but uh, the idea of going to 36 hours, um, you know, I like what Tim was saying, and I think Alex was also saying it. We, we've been exploring how do we provide time off or paid time off for, for volunteerism. Um, we don't have that built in as a benefit um, yet. But I, I, I really don't see us, you know, 40 hours. So we're trying to get, like I said, 80 hours of work out of somebody during 40 hours. We'd like to enhance productivity, not reduce the amount of, of, uh, of work. So I don't, I don't see that as part of the manu our manufacturing view. There is certainly those issues in terms of having a bunch of split shifts and smaller level shifts if we have that. But we're really trying to get away from being labor dependent mm -hmm. um, and be, you know, be have level load in our production so that we have fewer people operating and making goods all the time. Thank you, Eric. Tim. Yeah, you know, I think that's going to be difficult in a food manufacturing environment. Um, you know, we're so dependent on timing. Uh, you know, the milk has to be processed within a certain period of time. These things, a lot of it's time bound and um, granted, we want to, you know, in, in, increase throughput and those kinds of things. But, you know, we've tried different shift start and stop times before. Uh, we, you know, really opened our mind to try and think through part time. Um, we just haven't been able to apply it right now because of the way, may, maybe because of the way uh, our supply chain works. You know, we've got five buildings here in town and we run shuttle trucks all day long, right? So part of it might be supply chain. Um, part of it might be the fact that we're in a food production environment. So it, it's going to be tough. Ke Kelly, I can't imagine healthcare would be any easier. You guys no. are already working 80, 100 hour weeks. Yeah, you know, I think it's a couple of buckets. I think it's, you know, leaders. I think they work 40 hours and that's, you know, that's not even where what they work. I'm sure they put in 50 to 60. 
Um, but I think with, when I think about, um, and we try to flex that and we try to share, like if somebody's put in a lot of hours, we will co we'll cover for each other, different departments. So we have that flexibility to say, hey, take a Friday off. You know what I mean? You've, you, you're well over 60 hours already and it's Thursday. Um, so we do some of that flex, but I'll tell you, healthcare workers are so dedicated as leaders, they, it's hard for them to step away. And so we really do try to encourage that a little bit of a long weekend when you can do that. And if you can leave early on Friday, please do. As far as the workers that are at the bedside and staff that are taking care of patients, the majority of those um, work about 36 hours right now or 312s. That's kind of been our standard, what we do here. We do have part-time workers and we kind of flex, you know, we have the opportunity to, go, if you want to go to part-time, you can do that. We also have what we call part-time or casuals where they, they can work when they want. So we, we don't have a lot of that, but there's some flexibility in that. But if you're a full-time worker, you're usually working your 36 hours a week. Um, and, you know, we always try to think of ways that we can lessen that load and how we can help. But being a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week organization, it's really hard. So, you know, we're always open to that, you know, flexibility if we have it. But a lot of the times, you know, we don't. And Alex, as a trend overview, what have you got? Yeah, I'm going to echo everyone else. I think it, it really depends on your industry and your occupation. Um, so I will say we we do see employers now who are doing the four day work week. It tends to be more in the kind of professional level roles. Um, so finance, accounting, legal, those sorts of, I guess, sort of consulting jobs. Um, over the summer, they typically do a four day work week, everybody gets Friday off. Um, but at the same time, you know, you're kind of cramming all of that work now into four days. Um, so I think it really depends on how, how people can remain productive. Um, if the work's getting done, if it takes 40 hours, if it takes 30 hours, I don't know. Um, but I think that it's, it's gonna be hard to shake us out of this traditional um, sort of five day work week model. Uh, but I think there is, there is light at the end of the tunnel and the fact that it, it is currently happening. Um, it's just not happening everywhere and in every industry and for every role. Well, huge thanks to each of you for taking the time um, to be on this panel with us today. And to those in our audience, thank you. When you sign out of here, there will be a, a survey that pops up. If you would kindly answer those few questions, that would be awesome. I mean, what I've gathered from this conversation is, you know, we're all still continually evolving as humans do, but that just was accelerated because of the pandemic hopefully mostly in good ways. Um, the remote work option has made our world smaller and bigger at the exact same time. And because of that, and because of the, you know, literally the remote and the virtual uh, options, we need to be more intentional with recognizing we still are all human and we need those connections and care. Um, so wonderful to dialogue and presentations. Um, my, my heartfelt thanks. And I love to end any session or presentation with as we go out into the world, be well, be the light, most importantly, be kind. So thank you all and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.